So I'm not sure how this is going to work. I've got some videos uh, and uh, one of the last times I was on a panel, I just had snapshots of the CT scan and uh, I was made fun of. So uh, I videotaped them with my iPhone. So hopefully you have some Dramamine with you because uh, it's a little jerky. And um, uh, But if it goes too quickly, let me know. I was kind of expecting a mouse to because you can click on the uh, the actual picture. So if, it, uh, if you need me to review it or go back through it or something along those lines, just let me know. For those of you Skyping in, sorry, this is going to be a little bit harder for you to appreciate. Um, I do have one PEDS case uh, on there just for you, Sanjay, because I knew you were going to be on. Um, and, uh, and then there's some, some immunology, potential immunology questions uh, for you also, Drew. This is it. This is a chronically infected sinus. That's it. All right, well, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, Greg, thank you for the invite. This has been great. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to my two weeks of self-quarantine um, after this. So we'll jump right into the, uh, the cases. And these are patients that I've seen the past couple months or so. So 74-year-old woman comes in for chronic anterior rhinorrhea, uh, began eight months ago. Now, this was all supposed to be uh, um, uh, coming in on each click, so it's not, uh, doesn't look like it's working like that, but that's okay. We'll just uh, keep going through it. Uh, began eight months ago, she saw our primary care doctor, given saline mist, saline irrigations, and ipatropium bromide. Um, of note, she had a seizure and fell down some stairs two months before, and she's complaining of anterior drainage, nasal congestion. She's been on two antibiotics with no real benefits. Is there anything anybody else wants to know or any thoughts that you have uh, uh, so far on this? What do, you, what do you make of the fall down the stairs? Is she, like, is she dripping only from one side or both sides? She's dripping from one side or both sides? Uh, just the right side. I'm concerned that this may not be an infection. Okay. Do we have a CT scan or any other workup? We do. Uh, so here are her past, uh, past medical history. Again, it's small. The, the point isn't to read through all that. The point is just to see uh, that she's not the world's healthiest patient. Um, here are her medications. Uh, she's only in her 70s, but she looks more like she's in her late 80s, honestly. She's quite frail. She's very kyphotic. Um, and uh, uh, so she doesn't look uh, to be the healthiest candidate. Um, so before we did a CT scan, we scoped her, and uh, and you can see, and this isn't my most recent. Uh, these aren't my most recent slides, Lee. This is not my most recent talk. I uploaded loaded it yesterday. Um, I don't know that anybody's listening to me. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, um, I had it broken down. It was a little bit easier to uh, to make out. <coughs> The point is, is that uh, you can see the middle meatus is obstructed with mucopus on the right side. The left side, everything was pretty healthy. So um, anything you want to do differently now, panelists? If you can see pus, I usually like to culture it and okay. send it to see what it grows. All right. Drew, you want to start a biological yet? Uh, you know, if there's evidence of nasal polyps, you'd think of that first. But frankly, <laughs> if there's no evidence there, it's really hard to get that kind of thing approved. Okay, good to um, know. Good practice. Especially with this kind of atypical presentation. All right. Um, so this was the, uh, the culture. These were the uh, uh, culture results. So Staph aureus uh, and uh, strep anginosis. I don't know if that tips you off on anything. And, uh, and here you can see the staff, the, uh, the antibiogram, pretty much pan sensitive. So uh, I'd mentioned she had been on a couple antibiotics already. She had been on azithromycin, a ZPAC, and uh, amoxicillin, and really didn't get much benefit from that. Um, what, uh, what would you start her on um, uh, with this, Freya? Um, with this? I probably would consider either like the doxycycline. I would probably consider doxycycline and then maybe also add irrigations with mupirocin. Okay. Um, Doug, would you do anything differently? I'm still worried about the clear fluid in the fall. Okay. Sanjay? I, I'd, I'd see if she could collect it. Okay. Sanjay would. Uh, um, 
uh, yeah, I, I kind of uh, side with Doug on this. And the other thing that uh, I, in the Peds world, strep anginosis is a nasty player yep. for complications of uh, rhinosinusitis and also for pharyngitis. We see kids with neck abscesses and uh, uh, periorbital abscess and uh, a brain abscess often culture strep anginosis. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be having a low threshold for imaging for this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we gave her penicillin uh, initially. So uh, I gave it to her four times a day for 14 days, and she felt really quite a bit better while she was on the antibiotics. She came back a week or so after that, and uh, um, her drainage had returned. Any thoughts on that? I don't think so. All right, so here's a CT scan. I don't know if this will play or not. Shoot. Um, any luck on getting the... Can we play this video, Lee? Yeah. Um, okay. So what do you think? Uh, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is going great. This is going great. This, uh, the smoke's going to start pouring into the room again any second now. Um, all right. So, refer fortunately, to Dr. Davis. fortunately, I have some uh, contingency slides, and uh, we're going to jump right into it. Here's one of them, and this uh, projects horribly, uh, but you can see uh, in the slide behind uh, the big slide here, left maxillary sinus looks pristine. Right maxillary sinus is almost completely obstructed. One little air bubble there. And what do you see? Uh, if I had a pointer, I'd show you. What do you see right around that, uh, that molar? Dr. Ray, you want to tell us what you see? No bone. No Someone bone. said it. Yep. So, so what is this? Strep anginosis. You can see this. Here's another, uh, whoops, sorry. Another slide. Again, this looks terrible from the, on the projection. Um, There's like a defect on the... Yeah, so what are you thinking? Al, what are you thinking? You mentioned this yesterday. Exactly, donogenic sinusitis. I never said it was clear drainage from the nose. She had drainage from the nose and she was given it tropium. <laughs> So the the, that was a trick. the the point of that was it, it's true she really got it but it would have done nothing for her uh, for this. Um, all right, so odontogenic sinusitis. Um, again, this was not all supposed to come up right away. Uh, tell us what do you know about odont odontogenic sinusitis, Doug? Send her to the dentist. <laughs> Well, Al, you want to come up here and uh, so uh, so odontogenic sinusitis. Um, I think the rest of this talk is going to go about as well as this did. So we're just going to try to get get the pain over with as quickly as possible. Odontogenic sinusitis. Uh, uh, from a lot of different things, pulpal necrosis, root fracture, periapical, uh, uh, periodont uh, periodontal disease, or a periapical lesion. Now, usually we see the periapical lesion. That's what you could see on the CT scan if it projected at all. Um, and so uh, it is a very common thing. And depending on who you read, um, somewhere between 45 and 75 percent, some people claim as high as 90 percent of unilateral sinus disease involving the maxillary uh, is due to the teeth. And, uh, and so Al mentioned it yesterday. He refers, or was it this morning, I'm not sure, uh, refers to his antidontist to get them to evaluate that. No, that's uh, uh, part of the question. How do you manage this? Medically, uh, 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 surgically, do you send them to the dental? What are, what are your thoughts? I think both are important. I think um, having the dentist um, see them and pull the tooth, and then if they're not better, then offering them a max reentrostomy and antiretinoid, depending on what persists. I, I think there's no there's no playbook for this, and and I actually do offer my patients a maxillary antrostomy and washout, um, either in the office with a balloon or in the OR. Um, but the tooth definitely you t you have to tell them that the tooth needs to be pulled because the infection is not going to be cleared without it. A lot of times, pulling the tooth does not clear the infection. Sanjay, you want to you see a lot of uh, odontogenic sinusitis in kids? We can't hear you, sorry. 
and uh, Odon, odontoma is another thing. So I, I, we, we're collaboratively with our oral surgeons for such cases. And I think uh, their imaging actually can be really better than a CT scan for assessing the roots. So Panorex and uh, plain films are very effective uh, to di diagnose the situation. And of course, a uh, rotten tooth comes out. Yeah. So um, so there is some data on this. There's not a lot. Uh, but if you're interested, John Craig, C-R-A-I-G, he's at uh, um, Henry Ford or, or Wayne State. I can't remember which. They blend together uh, uh, in Michigan and Detroit there. Uh, he is, has done quite a bit of work on this and, and written several papers about this. The data suggests we had a, uh, a case series oh, probably seven or eight years ago. And then there's another case series a little bit bigger from, uh, from uh, Pittsburgh. And the thought was that if the disease extends outside of the maxillary sinus, so it involves the OME or other sinuses, they are at a much higher risk for needing surgical intervention, right? So uh, a sinus surgery. Usually the recommendation at that point in time was take care of the tooth first. And there's basically three ways to do it. You can pull the tooth, you can do a root canal, or you can do what's called an apicoectomy, where they go in from the side and clean all that out. Um, and uh, you know, again, which is the right option? I really defer that to, uh, to my, my dental colleagues for that. But, uh, but that is... Uh, uh, the first step, the second step, in my opinion, uh, and uh, and what we had advocated in our paper was, uh, if that didn't work, then do sinus surgery. And what we showed was that some people, a small percentage, uh, got dental uh, uh, work, and that's all they needed. Uh, some of them got sinus surgery, and that's all they needed, and some people needed both, sinus surgery and the tooth. And like Doug had suggested, you pull that tooth or you do the root canal, it's not going to get rid of all that inflammation. It's not going to get rid of all that bacteria. And so it can lead to a tremendous amount of inflammation, so a lot of those patients do need surgical intervention. John Craig, I'll, I'll call you in just a second. John Craig um, uh, compared these patients symptomatically, and what he found was is that the patients who undergo sinus surgery first, they have a, a resolution of their symptoms much quicker or much more quickly than the patients who have the dental work done. So both clear up, but it's a time frame of you know about a month or so with the sinus surgery and two to three to four months with the, uh, with the dental work. Thoughts or comments? Al, you had a comment back there? Yeah. Two comments. Uh, one is you've got to find a dental professional you trust yeah. who understands this process. Because most dental dentists don't know about this. Excuse me. Yeah, you got to find a. You have to find a dental professional, whether it be an endodontist or a OMFS or even a general dentist, who understands this process. Most general dentists do not understand it. And most of our patients that we see that has this, they've been to their dentist, and their dentist says their teeth are fine. Mm -hmm. So most general dentists are not going to find the problem. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I was going to follow up on, on what he commented about John Craig. We know that when they get sinus surgery, they get better faster. They can get better, and this is the data that we've reviewed. They, they, it looked like it was kind of equal as to whether just dental treatment or just surgery could make people better. Um, we plan to publish a series of 64 patients that have long-term follow-up over a year, and we've shown that the combined treatment of surgery plus whatever dental treatment is rendered does have a better long-term outcome than either monotherapy, you know, dental therapy or sinus surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, we're gonna submit that abstract for the fall, but that's what we've found, and that's, there's not a lot of data on it. There yeah. There hasn't been a whole lot of answers. I think so, that's a great so point. I'll call you in just a that. second. Um, what I want to point out here, though, is, is that part of the reason that uh, I think general dentists struggle with this is, is that the penetration of cone beam CT scanners in dental offices hasn't really uh, uh, gotten that high yet, and so they still have the two-dimensional apical films. And so with that, what you need is you need air in the sinus, to cause a contrast. So if you don't have the black air in the sinus like this patient does, that's full of gray. So you're not gonna be able to differentiate the pus in the sinus from the pus around the tooth apex, right? So that's why they miss this a lot. And so that's part of the problem with this. This is complex anatomy, it's three-dimensional anatomy, and, and they're trying to make it uh, uh, with two dimensions. So. So there's a huge failure rate with those things, um, and uh, but I think that as they're getting to more CT scanners in the offices, I think that that's going to help. Yeah, Doug. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm actually reviewing a case in Texas uh, where a gentleman had multiple dental uh, implants placed and showed up with a, I can't tell you too much of the case, so I'd have to shoot you, but basically he ended up with a, a temporal bone osteomyelitis. And this was, a, this basically the lawsuit is against someone who irrigated his ear thinking that he caused an otitis externa. And I went back and looked at his CT scans back into the, the cone beam done in the, in the office. And the otolaryngologist read that there was fixtures getting into the maxillary sinus with a little bit of a haze over the top of them. Actually did sinus surgery for the patient's ear pain and he didn't get better. And three weeks later, he got a facial palsy. And so they treated him for Bell's palsy and when you go back, uh, it was the, the dental fixture looks infected. And the majority of temporal bone and skull base osteomyelitis does not come from the ear canal. Mm -hmm. It comes more centrally, the pterygomaxillary fossa, petrous apex, maxilla. And so the significance of missing something like this or misdiagnosed, it could be really uh, pretty significant. Yeah, so uh, so some great points. Al and I were on a panel at uh, um, uh, the fall meeting and, and uh, on this topic. And so he brings up a great point. You got to find somebody who uh, understands this, who's uh, who's open to this, and um, you know. And so that's where getting on the phone and calling them uh, and explaining what you see and re remembering how to number the teeth so they know what to look at. That type of thing is important. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll keep going. But uh, one thing to um, Good, so these are the slides that uh, um, we had. The bacteria, again, you gotta look, um, strep and staph are the most common, but like Sanjay had pointed out, uh, the uh, strep anginosis, that's a, a bad player. Strep milia is a bad player. Those are really aggressive bacteria. And so if your pathologists or your micro labs just saying, well, that's normal oral flora, it's not normal oral flora in the sinuses. And so you've got to get the antibiogram to know what it's sensitive to. That's a huge, uh, uh, really important take home from that. Okay, so we're down to uh, to nine minutes. So uh, Sanjay, this one I put in uh, for you. Um, so I'll be asking you a lot of these questions. 12 year old male, three year history of sinusitis. He was hit in the right eye playing baseball and ended up with an orbital fracture. And uh, at the time it was judged as a non-operative fracture and he was sent home. One week later, he got a preceptal cellulitis. He was given uh, amoxicillin with clavulonic acid and he did better. Um, here is uh, his CT scan the day of surgery. This goes quickly, so you can see the orbital fracture, really not too much going on with that. Can you play that again, please, Lee? So no entrapment, nothing. I think the, the um, uh, non-operative management was perfectly appropriate, right? Um, so he comes back four months later and he's had these recurring episodes of right eye swelling. This is not him, this is from the internet, but this is what he looked like, all right? Now what? Sanjay, what are you thinking? Well, I, I think uh, I actually have seen a couple of kids like this that have had previous facial fractures that have recurrent uh, uh, periorbital swelling um, afterwards. And, uh, you know, we, there's sort of two things you, you, you can look at. Do you, you fix the orbit or do you improve the function of the sort of paranasal sinuses? And it's a joint decision with the family. But, you know, the uh, I, I kind of think the, uh, the improving the function of the sinuses uh, perineal sinuses may be a sort of lower risk, easier procedure than, uh, you know, looking at uh, repairing the floor, the orbit, or other tracks. Because it, it, it may not be that you, if you improve, if you fix an old fracture in the in the orbit, that you'll actually change the natural history of this. Because this is now more of a functional problem. There's some fracture you don't know in the ethmoid or the you know, that's resulting in a pocket that's just susceptible to sinusitis. So in these recurrent cases, we end up just doing a unilateral endoscopic uh, science surgery functional with the ethmoids and max ray sciences. Drew, would you consider a uh, uh, immune workup in this kid? Why, any thoughts about that as far as the recurring infections? It would depend on the history. If you, if you look back into his history, he's had some sinus issues. 
had some uh, you know pulmonary issues because we worry specifically about um, antibody deficiency in these and classically they present with both sinusitis they can have strange infections like this or you know pneumonias things like that so in someone like this i would get a history now if this was his only episode he has a reason with the fracture you know i I, I don't know whether I do an immune work out there, but certainly if he had a history of, of infections like this, that's when I'd look into it. And I'd specifically focus on antibody deficiency, mm -hmm. given that's the most common in someone this age um, and, you know, predisposes to specifically sinus and uh, pulmonary infections. There's a few other things I might look into, like complement function. Um, but uh, I, it would come down to the history, whether he did have a history of other infections that uh, would be concerning. Right. Panelists, any other thoughts? I'll just say I like I like Drew's comments because I, I think I hadn't really thought about that. If this kid has had a long history of recurrent sinusitis on top of that and some other red flags, uh, I, I think we would uh, do some more immune workup. The kids I see with immunoglobulin subset deficiency typically have multi uh, multiple sites of recurrent infections. So not just isolated rhinus sinusitis, but a history of recurrent otitis media, pneumonia. Those are uh, tip, you know those are standard questions in the office. And if they've got the history, I 100% agree with Drew. We'll head towards the immunoglobulin subset evaluation and complement and look for other, other uh, sort of causes. And then if we we will even dig deeper, sometimes looking for ciliary dyskinesia and even rare cystic fibrosis. The CF kids normally have some, you know, uh, they present earlier with the growth restriction and, and uh, recurrent pneumonia. So those are less likely in this kind of case, but they're, it's, on, it's definitely on the spectrum. I mean, I would try to simplify things. He, he wasn't having recurrent infections before the orbital injury, and now he is. And so it's, there's obviously clearly an anatomic issue here. And so um, what Sanjay said earlier about um, dealing with the sinuses and improving their drainage, I think, is the best thing you can do for him. Okay, well, that was pretty definitive. All right. Um, so here he is post-therapy. We'd given him a treatment. I don't know if that's going to work. And he looks pretty good um, afterwards, but um, and here he is when he's acutely ill. Maybe I should have put that the other way around, but either way. So you can definitely see he's got uh, he's got sinus there, and I think um, I think both uh, uh, Doug and, and Sanjay were, were right on that. Whenever you have a disruption of that orbital floor, I think it can narrow your ethmoid infundibulum, and I think it can predispose you uh, to that. Um, Oops, sorry. So uh, we took him to the OR for a uh, right maxillary antrostomy, uh, did well initially, and then uh, he called a few months later and continues to have the recurring sinus infections with drainage and some uh, eye swelling, but it's not as bad. Amy, do you have a question or are you? Uh... I, 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 I just have a consideration. So, sorry. I just have a consideration with fractures and, and something I've, I've seen. In that when you have a fracture, sometimes you have a piece. There's a piece of bone, and then it's a nidus of an infection. And so you have to be really um, diligent when you exam examine that CT scan and make sure there's not a free piece of bone that might be not, 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 now not have a blood supply and is, is a nidus of infection because it's necrotic. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, so uh, here is a CT scan post-op. And uh, Lee, if you could play this, I may ask you to stop at a couple spots. So you can see some swelling in the frontal, you can see some in the maxillary there, you can see an antrostomy. Can you slowly drag that uh, uh, anteriorly and then, yeah, slowly, slowly. So there's the antrostomy on the right. And keep going and stop. All right, what do you guys see there? Onsenet, yep. So uh, wh what are your thoughts on that? All right, they don't have any thoughts. So I'll tell you what, I th what uh, my thoughts were. Um, <laughs> my thoughts were that, well, I, uh, that we didn't get into the natural ostium with that first surgery. There's some retained uncinate and, uh, and some retained ethmoid. Uh, and uh, since I only have a minute and a half, uh, we took them back last Friday uh, and we um, uh, took the rest of that uncinate down and completely skeletonized the lamina. And I got some great pictures, but I forgot to add them um, on my... Uh, 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 
to my talk. And so it was interesting. I can't quite tell if the natural osteum was connected to the surgical entrostomy. There was swelling around there. And so I think that swelling was effectively creating an obstruction. Uh, so we opened that up really widely. We skeletonized that. Interestingly enough, the floor of the orbit, or I should say the roof of the maxillary sinus looked pristine. It looked great. You couldn't tell that there was any kind of a fracture. There wasn't bone sticking out. There wasn't any kind of a foreign body or nidus of infection like, uh, like Amy had suggested. And even though on the CT scan it looked like there was some lamina papricia uh, uh, defect, there was nothing obvious when you did that. It was soft and you could move it pretty easily, uh, but there was no herniated orbital contents or anything along those lines. So he's uh, uh, about a week out. We saw him on Wednesday and, uh, and he was doing well at that time. So Did you operate on the opposite side? Because he has disease on the opposite side now too. Uh, nope, nope, just stuck with the, uh, the right side. Um, no, my instructions are always for a week, um, but not. Uh, uh, David, but can you, do you mind repeating the question? Just oh so yeah, I'm sorry. Around should, the world watching us can hear the question. Yeah, the question was, do I tell him not to blow his nose for the rest of his life? And so, no, I just said for the next week or so. I always tell people not to blow their nose. Now, if there was a defect, and there was an obvious defect, or I had caused an obvious defect from either uh, surgical trauma or an orbital decompression, then I usually say a month, no nose blowing. Mm -hmm. All right. Good, so I am out of time. So I'm sorry I didn't get to the third case. This was uh, um, some really great pictures with, uh, uh yeah, I had a lot of really good questions with that. So anyway, um, next time, next year, next year when there's no, when COVID-20 I don't invite is anybody back <laughs> twice, sorry. <laughs> Maybe another 10 years, just kidding. Uh, so it, you do get your talk next. Yes. Just so you know, so if you wanna steal okay. uh, some of your own time, that's fine. Sure. But. Uh, Thank you very much, panelists. Sanjay and Drew, thanks for staying on board. Really appreciate you guys.